So it's a great pleasure to welcome Jörg Niedermeyer here um, uh, to our school and to our quantum information technologies course. Uh, he's inaugurating our series of distinguished lectures in uh, different aspects of quantum information technologies. So Jörg is a professor and chair of experimental physics at the Technical University of Vienna and has been pioneering um, uh, atom chip, which you will tell us about, but also quantum memories and other aspects of um, quantum technologies involving cold matter and um, including interference of this matter. And so I think we're very privileged uh, to have you here. Thank you very much for having come. Yes, so uh, <clears throat> thanks for giving me the chance of coming here. And uh, I would like to give you, I mean, this, I think this now lectures in the morning and then a talk in the afternoon. Uh, I would like to give you some kind of an introduction into uh, some of the experiments we did lately, which have to do with the question of uh, if you take a completely isolated quantum system, uh, does it relax? So the question is that, you know, the physics question is if you have an, an, a unit, the unit evolution of quantum mechanics in, in, in the microscopic sense, uh, does classical statistical mechanics emerge out of the, out of the uh, unit evolution of, of quantum mechanics? Uh, that, would give, that would be very nice to be able to show that because it would tell you uh, a very clear way of that, how classical physics emerges from quantum mechanics without any of these things of an observer and collapse of the wave function and blah, 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 all this philosophical baggage. But it would be just a very physical way of how classical physics emerges from quantum mechanics due to the relaxation of many body systems. And it has a, a very interesting also information aspect behind there because uh, the relaxation or, or not non equilibrium problems in quantum mechanics are problems that are exponentially hard. And so these are these are problems that are that are very hard to solve. But you can play with them in an experiment, you can make some kind of an analog quantum simulator to look at that. And there are many, many open many, many open questions. And I will talk in, in my lect in my seminar in the afternoon I will talk more about that. Now I will give an, introdu an introduction into, you know, how do we play around with this other called atoms and what some people call quantum matter, and uh, how are these other called atoms and model system to look at very intriguing quantum mechanical problems. And uh, so I have uh, my lecture basically give you an introduction and in how to, you know, how to make cold atoms and how to experiment with them and how to probe them. Uh, I don't know, if there, if there is something that you have heard already 15 times, tell me, then we can skip it. If there is something that you want to hear more about it, then tell me, then we, we go deeper into it and, you know, let's see how, let's see how, far, how far we get. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said, the important thing that, that was in, interest me is the realization in an isolated many-body quantum system. So the question was, why study isolated many-body quantum systems? And uh, <clears throat> as we said, as we're taking the external math as a source of classicality and realization does not really solve the fundamental problem of how classical statistical physics emerges from microscopic quantum evolution because you always have something they say, okay, I put it over there, yeah? And then you have to, so uh, that's not a very, very satisfying solution. So basically if you have a system that is completely isolated where you have no environment around it and you could show that these systems behave for all practical purposes after some time of realization completely like classical statistical physics yeah, in all observables that I can do. And I prepared some very crazy quantum mechanical state in the beginning. I could, I would basically have some kind of a way of seeing how, you know, classical properties of the proper system uh, emerge. 
and uh, because you know also that you know if you look at this here the bath you can always incorporate the bath in a very large isolated system. So in the end it, what you really want to study is, is a completely isolated quantum system. And in an experiment you need perfect isolation. Of course in an experiment, in theory you can always write down very easily perfect isolation. In an experiment the question is asked how perfect does it have to be? Uh, that's completely open, also from a theoretical point of view. Uh, what you will see in the, in the afternoon is that our systems, even though they are not perfectly isolated, uh, their physics, where we have a theoretical description, is perfectly described by an isolated system. So you, we assume that it's good enough. Yeah? Uh, we need a very well controlled initial non equilibrium state, and we really need, need to measure the main body quantum states during the time of evolution, and they ask the questions that what are good observables for looking at many body quantum states. And we will look at that in, in, in over the time. So that's basically the big, the big picture around it. Uh, now, why do you want to use cold atoms? I think if you take an example of cold atoms and hold them in a, in a conservative trap, you know, they are really, really perfectly isolated systems. Yeah? They have a very, very long coherence time of the atomic internal states. You can have very long coherence times of the external emotional states. So you can really say that this is a, 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 a really good isolated quantum system. Yeah? And uh, it allows, these atoms allow to realize a very large variety of models. There are many tools to prepare them. There are many tools to execute the quantum quencher and make a non-equilibrium state. There are many tools to prepare and control the quantum state. And we can change interactions, we can change confinement, we can change dimensionality, we can probably change topology. And uh, so there are many tools to probe them, and all these time scales are very easily accessible. So uh, I think that's why you know, coal, coal atoms are, are a beautiful system to probe many, many different things that you probably will see in, in your course of the lectures. You will see things from from solid state physics to cosmology that people can, can build model systems for in, in cold atoms and try to play them. And also, of course, both you know, ions, are, ions and ion traps are, you can write down very similar things for them. And I think Rainer will give you next, will come next week and give you lectures about ion traps. So uh, this morning, I will start, first of all, uh, talk a little bit about the atoms, the cold atoms as a model system. How to create them, how to manipulate them, how to, uh, how to use this type of, what you call an atom chip, this principle of mineralization integration, to make really, really very robust experiments, and then at the end of the CFR you get to talk a little bit about low-dimensional systems, and the methods to probe the many-body system, which is something that gets you already into, into the afternoon talk. <coughs> now, who has heard a course about cold atoms, lectures about cold atoms? Anything? Zero. Who has seen cold atoms? Yeah, okay. Good. So, uh, let's start very, very elementary. Uh, what are the basic experimental methods to do this? Uh, the first method is, of course, you have to get them cold. Atoms that are in, in the room temperature have typically velocities that are hundreds of meters per second. Yeah? So they are, they are 500, say 500 meters per second. It's a typical velocity, say, of the oxygen molecules here in the atmosphere. So if you want to get them, why do you want to get them cold? Because you want to look at them for a very long time. You want to have the de Broglie wavelengths in such a way that they can, can uh, the de Broglie wavelength becomes important when you do quantum experiments. So you're going to have to make them, get them to temperatures that are microcalvin cold. Yeah? It depends on, there are velocities that are given by, you know, millimeters per second or centimeters per second and not 
meters per second, hundreds of meters per second. We will get them to deploy wave things that are, fra that are fractions of a micron. And the samples that we can get are, you know, are 10 to the 8 atoms, which is, seems large, uh, typically. So a few hundred million atoms. And the densities are 10 to 11 atoms per cubic centimeter. And this is ultra high vacuum. So it's basically very, very small densities compared to what we have. Now, this is what cooling with light will give you. That's not enough because it's given that the final temperature you get that I will show you that is given by the recoil of a single photon has on your on your atom that gives you these cooling units. Now you can have uh, then you can basically trap these atoms and if they are so cold you can trap them in magnetic fields or in light fields and you can use them further cooling mechanisms inside these things like you like you have a, a, a you can cool things like with evaporation, you take off the hottest atoms and you thermalize. And then in the end you will get something like, like quantum gas. And this is now for many of the experiments basically study quantum this quantum gas. And this cooling in a in conservative trap leads you to something like what where you have very long deployed wavelength, you have small samples, and you have extremely cold temperatures, typically nanocarbon temperatures. Now, at the temperature scale, if you take a logarithmic temperature scale, yeah, so you have here, say, the temperature of the interior of the sun, here I have somewhere a molten metal, that's room temperature somewhere here. Yeah? And now we're going to talk about matter that's in a log scale, way, way further away from room temperature than the interior of the sun is from room temperature. Yeah? So basically, I think if you plot, if you would plot the hybridization, say the, temp the highest temperatures that are created in quark gluon plasma, so the temperature difference between the temp quark gluon plasma and room temperature is smaller than the temperature difference lower on the log scale between our atoms we work with in room temperature. So it's an extremely, extremely cold. But right? this only works if you make them only that cold because they are so perfectly isolated. You can really isolate. Them. So you have liquid helium is over here, the coolest temperature you can make it in, in a dilution of future rate of over here, and the laser cooling you get automatically somewhere down there, and the, the coolest temperature you achieve in the lab or somewhere around these directions, and some people even say that you get negative temperatures, but you know, it's part of it is it's just a, uh, a question of, of calling things. Now, how do you get to be a quantum gas? If the temperature is very warm, you know, the distance between the, your, your constituents is much, much larger than its deploy wavelength. So there you have physics of billiard balls. Yeah? Quantum mechanics doesn't really matter. If you get to very cold, then you start to see the deploy wavelength of, of each of, the, of your atoms that you have. And at some critical temperature, very colloquially speaking, these matter will start to overlap. And now if, the, if you have bosons, now if the matter will start to overlap, it becomes important what's the statistics of the, of, of the, of the particles. And if you have fermions, then uh, because there's a, a sign change in the, in the, in the wave function, if you change the symmetry, these, these the deployers would repel each other, but if you have bosons, they like to be, they like to sit on top of each other, and you get all of these, all of the, these meta waves start to coalesce and come form a giant, a giant meta wave. And that's interestingly, experimentally, a huge advantage because that process is given by something called stimulated emission. The same process that makes you the light in the laser. And so if you get below a certain threshold, atoms automatically always want to fall into that type of metabolism. It makes it very in a very simple way. Now that's basically 30 years of physics and many Nobel Prizes to get there. Yeah? 
So sometimes, if, typically, if you start an experiment, so you start with an, say, it's a rubidium, and you have a vapor of rubidium, which has a very short de Broglie wavelength and a very low density. Then laser cooling, which I will show you the basic principle of it later, gets you here. So it gets you a huge step in temperature, but not so much in density. And that was no price in 97. Then you have to, to massage them to get them in some kind of conservative trap. And the magnetic trap was part of the Nobel Prize in, in 89, to go from power. He was the first one who made these, these tra traps. By the way, for neutrons and not for, for atoms. Then you go and you have another step of cooling, which is this evaporative cooling, which gets you into into the Bose energy condensation, which was in low price for these three, these three guys. So, uh, now, <coughs> to get into the physics of what is happening from here to here, usually is the course of the whole semester. So, we'll try to give you a quick overview of the physics principles of how does, how does this work. Because it also tells you a little bit of what, what are the things you can do with this type of, with this, with these atoms. So the first thing is, uh, atom cooling, and what are the mechanical effects that light has on, on the system? And that's very simple. In a very, very simple picture, you can think of, let's assume we have an atom that sits in a ground state. So, okay, we, we always take atoms as two level systems. So you have some kind of a ground state, some kind of an excited state, and the laser light that comes in can bring the ground state to the excited state, and then there's some kind of a spontaneous decay of the excited state down to the ground state. And so for now, we basically ignore all atomic physics that there are many levels in the ground state, there are many levels in the excited state, that there are selection rules and all these other things. Uh, let's, let's ignore that because that's not important for, the, for explaining what is that, the, the mechanical effect of light. Now you can look at the mechanical effect of light in such a way that you, have a, you can take a billiard ball picture. You take a photon, and let's assume, we can always, because that's Galilei variant, it's, it's not a realistic physics, we can always assume that the atoms, we go in the rest frame of the atom. So the atom sits at, at has momentum zero in its rest frame. So it's a zero momentum. Now, if this photon absorbs, gets absorbed by the atom, the atom gets into the excited state, but the atom has to take up the, the momentum of the photon. Yeah. So the atom momentum will be 1 h bar k. The momentum of the, the photon is h bar k. k is the, k is the, the wave factor. It's 2 pi over lambda, and then it has a direction. And lambda is the wave in the lambda. Now this, this atom has a, has a momentum 1 h bar k. Yeah? And so there is a, you can calculate how much this really is, the real momentum, you can calculate that to the recoil energy. You calculate it's h bar squared k squared over 2m. After, after, now this atom decays, the spontaneous decay goes in all directions. And let's assume that it, it just goes in spherical symmetry. It goes in all directions, so the average momentum, the average momentum gets, that gets imprinted on the atom by the spontaneous decay is zero because it goes in all different directions. So one cycle like this, gives an atom, an average, one photon momentum. Now it's very easy to calculate how strong is the force on the atom, which is the force is dp or dt, the change of momentum by time. Now this is a discrete process, but you can say it's about delta p divided by delta t. Delta p we know is h bar k. Delta t we also can very easily calculate, that's the lifetime. The decay rate times the probability of being in the excited state is rho 2 in the density matrix. So it's the probability of being in the excited state 
And then if this is a, a resonant process, you have a bright Wigner resonance formula, which you can write in there. Depending on intensity, there's intensity divided by something called and, and a normalized intensity, the I0. And you see that they have some kind of a bright Wigner resonance. So the maximum size of this here, of rho to 2, is one half. Yeah? If you have any coherent drive with photons. In average, average probability of being inside the state is one half, the maximum. So you can calculate it's h bar gamma, h bar k over gamma 2 is the maximum four second half, and I can take what are the typical accelerations that a light can do on an atom. And you find out that it's it of course depends if it's a very heavy atom, it's going to be slow, weaker. If it's a very light atom, it's going to be light. But it's an enormous acceleration. It's something like 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 at meters per second squared acceleration it can do. Basically, it means that it can get a light atom that can accelerate within a distance of a meter up to 1,000 meters per second velocity. So, at a few times sound velocity. Yeah. So, it's, it's a very fast, it's a very fast, uh, uh, force, and you can imagine now that I have an atom, and I shine atom flies in this direction, shine light in the other direction. I can try to stop it. Yeah. Now, of course, I have to think about something that I have this funny form here. That this is a very narrow resonance. So there are there are more and more of these these type of problems. By the way, a very similar reasoning like this here. Is already was already done by Einstein in 1917 in his paper when, his, when he looked, talked about this thing, the consistency of a Planck's radiation law in thermodynamics. Where he, he showed that if you look at the Planck's radiation law and thermodynamics, that a, an atom, the motion of an atom is in thermal equilibrium with the temperature of the light field. Yeah? And for that, there was one term missing that this works. For that term, you had to postulate there's something like a stimulated emission, which is basically of the laser. So in that paper, you basically have in there everything, all the basics of laser cooling and all the basics of the laser. In that way of just still talking about the consistency of thermodynamics. Now, uh, that's a very nice Mickey Mouse picture. You can look at it more carefully. You would have to think about, you know, rate equations from the action relations. You have an absorption. You have a stimulated emission. You have a spontaneous emission. If you look at the quantum mechanics, the the motion of a driven two-level system can be described by these optical block equations. And if you don't have any decay, you would get Rabi oscillations. If you have a decay. Depending on how strong this decay is, you get the, these damped Rabi oscillations, and you you get uh, you can find that the line gets broader the stronger you drive it, and all these other things that come in there if you do a quantum mechanical calculation of the interaction between an atom and the light field. But it's, uh, I think you know this is just to show that there is much more behind it. But for the understanding the laser cooling, I think this very basic simple picture. So if you want to look at the, you know, how big the numerical factors are there, you have to look at the radio physics. There's another extremely nice way of looking at interaction between an atom and light, but for looking at it in the effect of an effective put, put the optical potential. Yeah. You can say that, that if you have an atom that interacts with the light field and that, that can decay into here, of course, this is into a different state, but if it is uh, quantum, quantum, quantum mechanically, this state 2 could be only, you know, if you have the state 1, you have some excited state, you're excited, and if it decays, this state 2 is the state 1 plus h bar k, so it's quantum mechanically a different state because of a different momentum. And it's the, it's the before. You can describe that you know, by a, a potential which is complex, which is some kind of a strength. 
uh, which is proportional to the electric field of the laser field that I put in there. Yeah. And it has an, an, a complex part which is proportional to the, to the decay rate and uh, depending on how large the tubing delta is, now you can plot a real and imaginary part on that and you get a, 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 real part of the, a, a real part of the potential which is the dispersion curve and an imaginary part of the potential which is this, this Lorentz light curve. So you can see the interaction between atom and light as a, a component that has a, a part of the potential that is a damping, another part which is just like a classical uh, potential, conservative potential. And if you go to very large, very far out, make this delta very large and omega very large, you can make this gamma very small and can make some, some effective potential will come back. To that. Now, what are typical numbers? We want to. So let's say that, say, I pick two atoms which are some of the pet atoms that people experiment with. There's rubidium and lithium, and these are all alkali, alkali metals because they have a single electron of a very simple level structure. So the typical wavelength is something like here. It's, it's, it's infrared, 780 nanometers, 670 nanometers, a really nice dark red, beautiful red. The, the typical scattering rate that you can have is something like 10 million per second. And a single photon gives a recoil, so the velocity that gets imprinted, velocity change that gets printed by a single photon recoil now is Say for rubidium it's about 6 millimeters per second, for lithium it's about 10 centimeters per second. The energy is very small, it corresponds to something like a few hundred nanocalvin or a few microcalvin. Yeah. yeah? And the maximum acceleration that they get is something like 10 to the 4 times g, that's an acceleration here at Earth, or about 10 to the 5 times g to the lithium atom. Typical thermal velocities, as I said, are a few hundred meters per second heavy atoms, of course, close, and then, and then and the slow atoms, is a light atom is much faster. But then we have one problem. As I said, this line, these atomic lines here, they're very narrow. The line is something like 6 megahertz. Now, if an atom is fast, there's a Doppler shift. Now, can calculate how big of a velocity does this Doppler shift correspond? Yeah? And I, I find that uh, the Doppler shift for the line width of the atom is only a few meters per second. Now, you can imagine that if I have, if you want to decelerate an atom that is hundreds of meters per second fast, and this force is really only strong if I'm very close to the center of that line. Otherwise, if by the Doppler shift I'm somewhere out here, the force is very small and I, I don't see anything. And so basically it means that I have to be careful that if I want to decelerate atoms, I always have to keep them in resonance. And the other thing is that you need tens of thousands of photons to stop such an, an atom. And these tens of thousands of photons means that I always have to keep the atom scattering and scattering and scattering and scattering. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why this works very nicely with atoms, but it's very difficult with molecules. Because molecules usually cannot scare tens of thousands of photons in the same transition. Because they fall in any different vibrational and rotational states, and then they are probably depending on. <coughs> so, typically, you know, as I said, you can, this then it takes them to stop, it's something like 50 centimeters, you can stop these atoms in 50 centimeters, it takes a few milliseconds, so it's a really strong force. Now, this is just, this is the force of the atoms. Now, how do I get, how do I get to cool? For that, let's plot 
Now, if I take an arm and I send light not only from one direction but from both directions on it, from two directions, yeah, then I have the laser that comes from the left, yeah, would have one uh, force profile and the laser from the right would have another force profile. Now, where this maximum, this profile now is, depending on the, this is the velocity, I'm sorry, there should be velocity, this is the velocity, yeah, now depends on, on the Doppler effect, because as I said, this line, which is a scattering rate, cannot, cannot be plotted. I take now a velocity v, and this is then a velocity v0, which is where the line is, has a maximum scattering rate. Now I can, if I don't do the following, if I now take this line, then it's a little bit too red, the frequency is a little bit too small. Then atoms that come towards the laser make a Doppler shift so that the light is in resonance. Yeah? So in that sense, if the laser comes from the left, yeah, the, the atom has to have a negative velocity to get maximum scattering. Yeah? If the light comes from the right, the atom has to get a positive velocity so that it gets scattered. Now you can see that if I take both of those lasers, then I get the total scattering rate is in the black line, it's just added. Now I choose this, that this is half a, half a gamma in one direction, and this is half gamma in the other direction. And then you get a beautiful straight line. You get a force, which is the round velocity zero, which is linear, proportional to the velocity. Now, what's a, a force that's linear proportional to a velocity? It's a damping force. It's friction. Yeah? So basically, by, by putting two lasers onto an atom at the right frequency, a little bit red from the, from the real frequency, you get a very strong damping force. Very strong damping. It basically means what does damping mean, or friction mean? Basically means that in velocity space, the velocity will be down to zero. So the basic means that if I do that and my atoms are slow enough so that they can talk to this, so that the, their velocity is within this range, they will automatically go down to zero velocity. Yeah? Now, uh, basically that would mean, okay, I do that and I get perfectly zero velocity. There's something wrong, huh? It cannot be really perfectly zero velocity because uh, in all these things, remember as we said F force is dP over dt, but we said okay, it's delta P over delta T, and delta P is the, the momentum h bar k, which is imprinted by a single photon. And this is that is so it's it's a dis discrete steps. So this is not this is not a continuous process, but it's a process in discrete steps. So it's a diffusive process. And now that was already also calculated correctly in Einstein's paper that this diffusive process leads to some heating. And if you do that, you find a, a velocity a limit that the temperature yeah, T to KBD that's an energy is proportional to H bar gamma O2 so it's half the line width now the interesting thing is that if you take you know Einstein did not do the calculation for a very narrow frequency and a line width of the atom but I actually did the calculation for max for max uh, for plant distribution, plant uh, uh, distribution of frequencies and in, and a zero line with atom, yeah. And now if you just take exactly Einstein's calculations and put in there a zero frequency, a, a sharp line of the photons and a line width of the atoms, you get exactly the limit, which was a, that was derived. Uh, then in the, in the 70s, 
yeah, by by Hench and, and, and Dave Weinland and, and others. Yeah. So, uh, but it's, what is nice is it basically tells you that the temperature is proportional again to the uncertainty that I have here, which is the uncertainty in the frequency of the hour. So it's some kind of a like, light thermal consistency limit. Now, these atoms are very narrow, this, gamma, this language is very narrow, and you get automatically something like hundreds of microtons. So the amazing thing is you take an atom, you shine laser light from two directions, and these things cool down to amazingly cold temperatures, just for free. Yeah? Which I think is, is, is really an amazing part. And then, if you don't only have atoms that, are, that have two levels, but they have many different levels, there are other processes in there which get you that, which get you even colder, yeah? which get you to microcarbon. And also that is basically for free. There's always a funny story that, that Bill Phillips uh, tells that, that they wanted to measure the, the temperature of the atoms and they, they calculated, okay, the temperature is whatever, it's a few hundred microcalories from the theory if you take an atom cloud, it's here and if it's a hundred, few hundred microcalories, these atoms should, you know, if you switch off where they're held in the laser, they should expand and they should expand in all directions, yeah? And for them it was easier just to try to measure the atoms above. I didn't see anything. They experimented for half a year, thought everything is wrong, the experiment is wrong, until they just put that laser that was detecting atoms below and immediately saw the atoms. And they found out that the atoms didn't have 200. 40 microcalvin, but had 20. And that, for 20 microcalvin, these things are so cold that gravity turns them around and it didn't get to the upper laser where they wanted to see them. Yeah. So, uh, as you said, it's, this was something that came for free. And it was an, a theory to that and how this works. It's done by for quantum machine. Now, this is for cooling. Now, uh, I mean, just, just making cooling the atoms and, and, and making them cold is nice, but you want to hold them. And there comes another very simple way, very simple way to look at it. Now, for that, we have to take an atom which is, which is more complicated, but it has now three different excited states. There are three different magnetic excited states, which has magnetic quantum number minus one, zero, and plus one. And now, if I take, so basically means that a certain polarization of the light that talks only to this state, or talks only to this state. And now I can use a magnetic field, magnetic field gradient, like a linear magnetic field gradient, which shift these levels like that. And now, the amazing thing is that you take exactly the same configuration used for cooling, yeah? shine light from one direction and the other direction with the correct polarization, and then you find again, instead of the Doppler shift, now the magnetic field shifts your lines in there. And then if the atom goes away from the center, the line that is with this laser gets into, into resonance, and the atom gets pushed back, and the light and the, and the line which is in rest, which, which talks to that other frequency gets away from the rest laser and so the scattering of this light is suppressed. So you automatically get a push in this direction or if you go in space in that direction, you go that direction, pushing the other direction. So the amazing thing is that if you take a two coils, which is an anti harmonics configuration, so basically means that you have a magnetic field that is zero in the center and grows linearly in all other directions. And you take the correct polarization of the light fields, <coughs> you automatically get for free laser cooling and trapping. So you do that, and it, it is such efficient that you don't even need to slow down your atoms. You take a cell which has vapor in there, rubidium vapor or something like that, 
shining light in the right direction, and you for free get 10 to the 9 atoms, which are, which are 20 microcalories. Yeah? And then basically revolutionized you know, all the different types of, of, of physics that can be played with, with that. Because suddenly you have sizable examples of atoms that sit there, they are extremely cold, and it's some very simple, very beautiful uh, physics to describe that. Now you could think about and say, wait a minute, atoms are not that simple. You know, if you take a real atom, this is level structure of a sodium atom. Yeah? I always now talk, there are two level atoms and two levels and everything like that. A, a real atom, even a very simple atom like the sodium atom, has an interaction with the light field that goes through all these different transitions here. Yeah? And so in principle that's a mess. Yeah? And if you want to look at that in more carefully, okay, of course you can describe that, you can get the magnetic moments, you get the matrix elements, and everything seems to be extremely complicated. But there's a very simple way which makes it experimentally extremely simple. If you shine light in there with a specific polarization, say with sigma plus light, then if the atom sits here, you know, and it's, it, it's, the atoms get from here pushed up to here, but from there they can decay either down there or they can de de decay down there. So if you shine light on there with sigma plus and that frequency, after some time all the atoms will be in this state. Yeah? And now if you shine light on there, With, with that, again sigma plus, suddenly all the atoms will end up in this state. So by shining in, and that's after scattering a very few number of photons, say five or something like that. Yeah? And remember, in laser cooling, you need to scatter tens of thousands of them. So if you, if you shine the light in the correct polarization onto these atoms, they automatically select so that they are, that they operate like a two-level system, yeah? Which is a very nice thing, by the way, this op for optical pumping, this was also an open price in the 60s, yeah? So there's a very simple way of doing that. So basically, selecting very specific polarizations, you can get to, even though in very complicated atoms, to something that looks very close to this very simple description, that's why even though in these very complicated systems, this very simple description of two levels or three levels or whatever we need is sufficient to describe the physics of it. Yeah? So we have that. So this is basically how you get yeah. you pump atoms over there. And though even even for example if you use this this transition for optical pumping, you end up in that state and that state doesn't even talk to the light field. So you can take Everything over there get very high, very high polarization of the system, and so we can, we can make it. <coughs> it's, it's a very simple and beautiful way to do that with a laser. Now, the next thing is that if you want to trap atoms, I trap them with the light field, but they, are sit, they sit still in the light field, they scatter the light field, so it's not a conservative trap. Now, to make a real trap for atoms, uh, you know, nature has something against that. There's something called the whole, something is called an Urgell theorem. And an Urgell, the Urgell theorem goes back in, 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 I think it's the end of the, end of the 19th century, and the beginning of, of Maxwell's equations and, and things like that where the Urgell theorem says it's impossible to arrange any set of charges to generate a point of stable equilibrium in a charge-free region. There was a question that can I trap a charge in a charge-free region? And I actually showed that this is just from, 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 uh, from uh, the perspective of Maxwell's equations, it's just not possible. 
you will see that China, with its iron traps, has to go, has to build very specific traps, which are not static sets of charges, but they are dynamical traps to be able to trap its iron. Yeah? Now, these virtual theorems, well then, you know, when people started to work with these cold atoms, extended to many different other things, such as the optical virtual theorem, so that says that the light scattering force in proportion to the local pointing vector, it's impossible to construct an optical trap. There's no free maximum theorems, which is in general, you cannot uh, get any combination of E, B, e field, the B field, and gravity, and everything, to make a really stable trap. So you have to be more, more creative than that if you want to trap atoms in that in, in this type of thing. In this optical urge theorem, you can say, OK, I can take, if I only take half two dimensions, and I can focus atoms with the half, half two dimensions. I can do two, but in three dimensions, you can So, uh, if you do not add a trap with conservative fields, I have to check about how to, how to do that. I can have, I have electric fields and I have magnetic fields. The one is a strap effect, the one is a Zeeman effect, if you look at neutral atoms. I can use static fields, yeah? or I can use fast oscillating fields. And all of these things allow you to, to do many, many different things. The first thing I want to say is, is look at a dark hole trap. Basically, it's a fast oscillating electric field. Basically, it's a laser field. There's a very simple way of looking at that. If you take an atom, you get grounded and inside the state. If you call, this is atomic frequency and this is a laser frequency. Now, if you take an atom that's driven by this laser frequency, I can talk about. I can write down a letter of states. This is, X, this is the ground state and n minus 1 photons in the laser field. And this is the ground state and n photons. And this is the excited state and n minus 1 photons in the laser field. And that's that different energy difference is the atomic energy. And that energy difference, now if you take add one photon, is the laser difference. So now you have, if this if omega laser is omega atom, these states are degenerate. If, if laser frequency is a little bit different than the atom, these states are very close together. They, they are different by the two D delta. Remember from the basic quantum mechanics. You got it. If, let's assume you have one. So this is some kind of parameter. And you have, remember, there's state one. And state two, and it's energy, the energy changes with some parameter p. And if I have a coupling between state one and state two, then the, new, the eigenstates look like that. And this energy difference here, this is each per omega, the coupling of the two systems. So the same thing happens here. That if these atoms interact with the light field, these two levels are repel each other. And then you can very easily see that this level gets shifted down, this level gets shifted up. And if you would now take an atom that goes, sits in a Gaussian laser beam, this shift would look like that, because the coupling gets, is very strong in the center of the when it density is high, it's very weak outside. So you can see that either an atom, this upper state gets repelled from the center, this lower state gets attracted from the center. Now you want to have the atom in the ground state. So you want this to be the ground state of the atom. It basically means if that is supposed to be the ground state, it means that the laser frequency has to be smaller than the then uh, uh, has to be smaller than the uh, uh, than atomic frequency, and then I get that atoms get attracted to the to the maximum.
Now this is very similar to something that you have in, in biophysics or in anything else you take. I say take the dialectic sphere and put it in the focus of a laser beam. Depending on if the refractive index of the dialectic sphere is larger than the medium, then there is more light that gets deflected upward than light that gets deflected downward, and then will push the sphere into the center. You get optical trapping, optical tweezers. Here, if the dialectic sphere has a smaller refractive index, then uh, this gets pushed out because there is more light that get, gets deflected down than gets deflected up. So, the way of trapping atoms in light field is basically exactly the same physical process than dialectic spheres in an optical tweezer. Now, for a potential like that, this interaction potential is, is uh, omega squared, the dialectic field squared, divided by the tuning. And the scattering rate is omega squared over delta squared times gamma. So you see that if you this is basically that the scattering rate is the potential, is typically is, is proportional to the potential divided by the detuning. So if you go further and further and further away, I can reduce the scattering rate relative to the potential. And that's, so to speak, the trick how to make this trap of traps. Therefore, if I take a red detuned laser, it will attract my arms in, if they will move it to the laser, it will reflect them out. Now that's the basis of many of the laser crafts. You take a focus beam, it's rightly tuned, and you put the arrows in the center here. You take two beams, you can hold them here, you take a standing wave, you can get a lattice. If you take one lattice, one standing wave, you get a lattice, you can you take three standing waves, you get an optical crystal. And that's the basis of many of the experiments that are also done with the arrows. Uh, optical lattice type of experiments. Mm -hmm. so nice picture here. Two lights give you pancakes. Four light beams gives you cigars. Six light beams gives you dots. So this is from stolen from the mother box. Right. Now uh, we take atom trapping and do magnetic traps. I have to look at how do the magnetic states of these atoms evolve with the magnetic field. And usually we have, you know, in an atom we have different hyperfine states and then we have different other magnetic states. And so typically this is a hydrogen atom or this is a sodium atom. This is deuterium, this is hydrogen. But, you know, the only thing you have to remember is that there are certain states whose energy gets down if you put them in a magnetic field. And in certain states, its energy goes up if you put them in a magnetic field. So these states are attracted to the maximum of the field. These states are repelled from the maximum of the field. They are attracted to the minimum of the field. Now, these states would be perfect if I could make a maximum of a magnetic field in free space, which I can't because of urgent theorems. So that means that I always, but I can make a minimum of the magnetic field. So if you take a minimum magnetic field, I trap atoms in these in these minimum states, these minimum seeking states. But that's in some sense is a problem because it's not the lower state that is trapped. Yeah? So the atoms can make spin flips to go down there. That's the lowest energy state is this one. It's not this one, but I can only trap atoms in the states that go to the minimum. So that means that and what stabilizes the atoms up there? Because they have a spin. Yeah, they're magnetic. And that's, that's this beautiful, I mean, probably everybody has seen that. You know, that, that, that toy, which is a small magnetic, is, is a small uh, top, magnetic top, that's stabilized by its spin, spinning, and therefore, it can be held in the middle of a magnetic field 
that sits up there because there is a big but magnet in there and you get the minimum magnetic field here and gravity holds it down so that the, the spinning top sits here. The way that this works is exactly the same way as we trap the atoms. You know, that's why also Wolfgang Kettel in the beginning was going around with one of those things, to, these lectures, to show him how the magnetic trapping works. And I think, and if you if you play with that, you will see that if it, if it starts, if the spin uh, gets uh, gets slower and slower by air resistance, suddenly this thing flips because the magnetic field created and everything wants that to turn. It's a much much lower energy. If, if you hold, if you hold it up there, you will see that it, it really t tries to turn it. So this is not the lowest energy state. The lowest energy state would be the one which is exactly the other, the other where the dipole, the rotating dipole is exactly flipped, but then it gets pushed down to this part. Yeah? So that's, in that sense, it's exactly the same way as we trap atoms. Except that the atoms are this, you know, quantum spins. But. Now, uh, there's a problem with, uh, with magnetic traps in that sense that the simplest magnetic trap would be one, would be a quadrupole, like this here. But this quadrupole has a problem that in the sense that it has magnetic field zero. And if it's magnetic field zero, you know, from quantum mechanics, you know that the quantization axis, the spin is not defined. So the spin can very easily flip and then it's gone. So I cannot make a magnetic trap, and it's not, or it's not advisable to make a magnetic trap, where we have a zero in the field. Therefore, you have to go through different types of tricks to play around, like uh, configurations like this, or some other magnetic field configurations, which basically prevent you to have a zero in your center. Yeah? Which is, uh, if you look at Maxwell's equations, you have to basically break one of the symmetries, otherwise it's not, it's not possible to add. Because if you take a quadrupole and you add an, add an additional bias field to it, the only thing what you do is you shift to zero. So you have to break the symmetry in such a way that, that the symmetry of the quadrupole in one direction so that you can, can have a, a, a directional field on that. But that's, uh, okay. It's technology. This is things people, you know, you go into. There's one way is just, just to break the symmetry and make a trap like with some funny wire geometries. Or you can optically plug the center of the trap, or you take a quadrupole trap and rotate it, make it a dynamic trap in the same way as when you, you know, when you stabilize this type of thing. You, know, you can stabilize it in some way. So that same thing is some kind of dynamic trap. And Eric Connell's trap where did the BC was something like that. So this is, there are many different configurations. This is one of Volkan's traps, so it's a very complicated arrangement of wires that give you a magnetic field. I think that it's like that. And, uh, yeah. Traps we use, and which I maybe also go in later, are traps which are based on very simple structures with bias and additional bias field so you can get a minimum sitting here and then if you if you take it make a trap that which has which is like that you get a quadrupole if you make a trap that is like that you get get rid of the quad of the zero of the field. The third part which is nice to trap is that if you take magnetic fields but you make oscillating magnetic fields and that's in the same way as with an optical field, you get a, an interaction between the ground state and the excited state. Here you get interaction, you can drive magnetic transitions like in an, in, an, in an NMR spectrometer or something like that. But now you drive it between, between magnetic transitions between, uh, between the states that sit in the trap, and then it can, it can make uh, very intricate uh, potentials and, and some of the things I will I think these are the potentials we use to make double worlds. Up to now we had basically said how do we get atoms in, in these traps and how to code them. Now uh, 
turns out that laser cooling is not good enough for basically most of the species uh, to get to Bose-Einstein condensation. In fact, there was an experiment, I think, two years ago or something in Innsbruck, where Florian Schreck managed to cool strontium directly to BEC. But that's, uh, you know, very specific because they're, they're very specific uh, things that, that help you to do that in, in, in strontium. Uh, but regularly, in the, in the both sides you call it, the temperature is not cold enough that you get to, to, to do that. Now, by the way, there is some, if you want to play around with the, with the various types of uh, physics of laser cooling, if you go to that website, there are very good educational apps, Java apps, that allow you to play with these things and play around with laser cooling and change laser frequencies and things like that that are simulated and also cooling to both sides. Now, how to cool further, and that's evaporative cooling, and it's a very similar uh, way of how you your tea or your coffee gets cold, because uh, when you have evaporation, the highest uh, energy atoms and molecules come out of the liquid, and therefore take away a lot of energy from your, from your system. So the idea was that you take a tap and you have atoms sitting there somewhere. And you basically take, you know, the hottest of these atoms out and let the other ones be thermalized, then you should get colder and colder. That's an old idea that when the, uh, you know that this really works, it goes back to a PhD student from uh, in Kartner. And because one of the problems is that, I mean, I can very easily, you know, take out the high energy tail of the Boltzmann distribution. Then I would get the distribution like that, but that doesn't make it cold yet. To really make it cold, it has to be thermalized. Yeah? And for that to be thermalized, the atoms have to collide. So there have to be three to four collisions of each atom has to take until you get again at the temperature of Boltzmann -like. Distribution. Now, you can imagine that you know our density in these atoms is not very high, these traps. And if I have a a box trap, yeah, then by throwing atoms out, you know, the density gets lower and lower and lower, and so the collision, the number of collisions that we have will get lower and lower, and something in this process should stop. Now what uh, what has realized is that if you don't have a box, but if you have a trap, or especially, that's what both candidates have realized, if you have a, a trap that's linear, it basically means that if you throw atoms out and get colder, also the volume gets smaller. And if you get to a regime where even though you take atoms out, and it gets colder, the rate of thermalization goes up. And so that's some kind of a runaway regime, and that allows it to really cool very, very efficiently. So uh, basically what you do is you take, as I said before, you cut and like try to be thermalized, and uh, so there's a key parameter which is the temperature loss, temperature decrease per particle loss. And you can find out, you know, which type of potentials you do and how you do that. You can get into to run something that's called runaway evaporation. By the way, this, if you, this is the original paper by Hess in 86, and then these are the papers that uh, some of the papers which really, uh, really look at the theory that's behind that. Now, uh, the funny thing is, how many collisions do you need per lifetime in the trap? Because if you have atom-atom collisions, there are elastic collisions, and there are bad collisions, because there could be collisions that flip the spin, and then the atom is gone. There could be collisions that make a molecule, you know? This is a much, much lower energy state than trapped atoms. So there's always a problem of 
of uh, how many good collisions, which is uh, elastic collisions, to have compared to collisions that lead to loss, or to heating. And the real big surprise was, I think that's what no one ever thought, is that to get to this regime of runaway evaporation, that you get that the collision rate gets so that evaporation becomes you know better and better and better the cooling, is if you have in a linear trap only 25 collisions per lifetime. So you might also have a life you might also have you know background gas collisions or something like that. So if each atom has 25 collisions during during their lifetime, you can get to a regime where you get running by evaporation basically you can get to the DC. And that's something that's not that's not so bad. And if you take a harmonic trap it's 150 collisions per lifetime. Yeah? So uh, this is something that and, and why is it why is it better than a linear trap? Because the volume and the density, the, say the density goes up much faster in the linear trap with temperature, with lowering and lowering the temperature compared to the monitor. And uh, so it's, it, this is, is a very, very efficient process. And how do you do that? If you take, if you are in a magnetic trap, you have your magnetically trapped states, these are the the higher energy states, and these are the magnetically untrapped states, which is the low energy states, and you just put the radio frequency photon, it basically flips the spin and takes the atoms out. And because that's in resonance only here, it only takes out atoms that have velocities that are high enough, energy that are high enough that can reach up to this very high potential. And you get a very, 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 very efficient way of cooling. Now, uh, of course, you throw away many of the atoms, but you gain. So typically, you throw away 99% of the atoms with evaporative cooling, but you gain six orders of magnitude in phase space density, which is something that you would never think of, say, in a box trap, because if you take 99% of the atoms out, you know, the density gets very, very small. But here, we take most of the atoms out there, you know, the density doesn't get small because they are confined to a very, very small place. So in that sense, you know, physics in the trap helps you enormously to make that, make that happen. And so it's, a, it's an extremely efficient way of cooling, even though you throw away many atoms. So basically, if you want to make it both energy funds, that you're going to have enough atoms in the beginning. And if you have enough atoms in the beginning, you get your BC. The only reason why you don't get a BC is either your loss is too large or you don't have enough atoms. Yeah? And so this is an extremely so in the experiment, this is something that always works. You know? What doesn't work is a laser cooling. So if, it, if the BC doesn't work, if the experiment doesn't work, it's mostly the simple laser cooling in the beginning. These later parts are extremely, extremely robust. Good, so now how do we observe such a quantum gas? What you usually do, the simplest way is basically imaging. You take an image, yeah, and these atoms absorb the light. You take an unresonant light, they absorb the light, and you basically image the shadow. Yeah? So you take your light, this is the, the atomic cloud, and you just image the shadow on, on a CCD camera. You can do, of course, more tricks. You can make an a dark field microscopy, you can take all the tricks of microscopy now to measure that. But basically what it is is that you measure the, either the refractive index of the cloud or you measure the absorption of the cloud. And if the, if the, dense, if the cloud is very dense, you give an optical density larger than 100, then it's much better to use the refractive index. If the optical density is very small, then you can you can uh, use this small. You can use uh, just absorption imaging, and uh, if your sample is large enough, then you can measure you know many different times the same the same cloud. But of course, uh, uh, the the imaging doesn't doesn't is is, is always a, a disruptive or this destructive process that you have. So that always introduces quantum noise. 
So in that sense, you know, absorption in these shadow imaging is, is a beautiful way of looking at the system. It has its limitations because it, if the sample is very, very dilute, it doesn't really work. Isn't nice? But another thing is that you can look at fluorescence. And so fluorescence is that you, you let your atoms, you know, scatter light and measure the scattered light. And for that, for there you can see single, single atoms. You can see single atoms, you know, where when you measure momentum in time of flight. Yeah? But basically you have your, your atomic cloud, you drop it, it goes through some light sheet, like in the fluorescence microscope. It emits light, you image the light and you see the pictures. And this is, by the way, an extremely robust way of measuring that. There's an extremely high, you can see every, so these are, these are, these are, all these dots here are single atoms and this is the boson action condensate that sits in the middle. And that's in the log scale, you see that there's a very, you know, weak background and there's a boson action on the log scale. There's a huge dynamic range where you can see. If you hold the atoms in the lattice, you can image, you know, where atoms sit in the lattice, it's a beautiful work from state wise. Or this is a, a big lattice, and this is a very narrow lattice, this is this quantum gas microscope where you can have the image atom sitting inside one of those lattice traps. And each of these dots is a single atom, probably more than one atom sitting there. So basically, what this, these are the, the, the basic principles of of of, doing, of getting these gas systems, these optical atoms. We do our experiments on something that's called an atom chip, which is basically taking things that I showed you before and integrate them on a single uh, nanofabricated chip. Now, you know, Gaina will tell you how to do that with ions. So, uh, yeah, they took these ideas from the atom chip and put them on to uh, use them to fabricate ions and ion traps. And I think that this, is, this gives an extremely well, robust way of doing it, that type of experiments to that. And, and many of the experiments that I show you in the afternoon, you know, have to do that. We can do that because we can make tens of thousands of experiments in an extremely robust and reproducible way to look at the really statistical properties of. of many body systems. Otherwise, I think it would be very difficult to do, but the chip gives you this very difficult way of doing it, and usually what you have is it's, it's these chips are uh, uh, metal surfaces on semiconductor substrates. And, you know, there are wires put on the chip by, you know, by nanofabrication in that gold substrate. So what's the basic principle? I mean, the idea was, in the beginning, uh, that you, you combine, you know, these cold neutral atoms, which is a really well controlled quantum system with the technology of nanofabrication, microelectronics, uh, to make really tools for quantum optics. And you try to create a toolbox for building these type of quantum devices. Now, you remember that, you know, miniaturization integration was extremely important for, for electronics or for optics, and you just wanted to do that for meta waves and for, for quantum experiments. Now you have again the interactions, as I showed you before, we can go quicker with that. There's a magnetic interaction, little b. There's electric interaction, one half alpha e squared. And there are the these stress state potentials, potentials using an optical. An optical. Now, uh, both of those things, especially electric potentials, you need very st strong field gradients. But if you come from microscopic structures, a few volts per micron field gradient or fields or field micron are very easy to create. And so you can make electric fields, electric potentials, and magnetic potentials. If you use microscopic structures, electric potentials are very hard to do because you cannot you know, kind of get these high field, field gradients uh, in, in, in microscopic structures. Now, how do we make a microscopic trap? Because if I want to make a microscopic trap, 
I have to be careful that, you know, that I can really, you know, microscopic structures cannot carry huge amounts of, of current and, and things like this. So there's a, the basic principle of making a microscopic trap. You take the field of the wire, and the field of the wire is given like, has a field that goes like 1 over r. It grows 1 over r by going to down to 0. And it's a nice, it's a nice physics problem because it's a Coulomb-like problem, but with a vector couple. Now, I cannot make a trap with that because, you know, I want to, I need to get the minimum of the field somewhere and I need to have that away from that surface where the wire sits on. So, but there's a very old idea which goes back to Fisch and Zigbein in 1932 where they wanted to do an, uh, an experiment of verifying my Yohana transitions and so the spin flip transitions and to do that they wanted to make a very well controlled minimum field. So what they said is that they take a wire, take a homogeneous bias field, we take a wire and a homogeneous bias field to get a minimum of the field. And this minimum of the field, if that field is orthogonal to the current, is exactly zero. And the minimum of the field is exactly, where is the minimum of the field? is exactly where this and these fields cancel each other. Now, this has an interesting scaling properties. Because what happens if I make that current smaller and smaller? Make that current smaller and smaller. Yeah? Then this point where this field is compensated by that field gets closer and closer to the wire. Okay? So the minimum, so that, that gets closer and closer to the wire. But now let's think about what's the gradient that I have here. The gradient is given by the field divided by the distance. So it also means that if I make that current smaller, I get a trap which gets closer to the wire, but which has a much has a stronger confinement than before. So it has a completely different scale to mac in a macroscopic trap. I need really lots of current, lots of magnetic field to make a tight confinement. Here, if I make that current smaller, the trap depth stays the same because the trap depth is given by that field. From there, anywhere where I go, the minimum field I see is this homogeneous field. But the, the confinement, the gradient, depends on inversely proportional to the wire. So basically, I can get the trap, which gets tighter and tighter confining. Yeah? The smaller I make the current. That's basically the perfect scaling for making a type of this, this, this type of trap. So the gradient goes one of the, the confinement goes one of the current. Yeah, the depth is a bias field, and it's always good. A homogeneous field is very easy to create compared to any, any other fields. And this minimum, I can very well adjust how big is this minimum. I can adjust by the angle between the bias field and the curve. Yeah? And so I can get a minimum of the field depending on this angle. Yeah? So basically, you mount the wire to the surface, use non fabric and rebuild these structures, and make these structures. You know, if I make a very small structure, and I cannot send much current through there, but it's okay. You know, my trap is given, depth is given by the homogeneous bias field, and the trap will be very strongly confining. So you get something like, like in quantum electronics, quantum wise. So you get very, very tightly confining structures. And that makes it, makes it easy. So, so there's a very high anisotropic traps. They can be, they can, you can make very, very tight confining traps. And it's very easy to, now it's a question of, of electrical engineering, which type of wire configurations do I do to, uh, to create correct fields? And it turns out the very simple <coughs> configuration is the same shaped wire plus a homogeneous bias field gives you exactly the same type of trap geometry that you know, Wolfgang Kettler's big traps have. Yeah? Except they now use milliwatts of power and they, they, are, they are fabricated in the surface and they are very robust. We can go and calculate what's there. That the magnetic field you know, goes like one of the radius, the gradient one of the radius squared, and the curvature that you can make is one of the, one of the radius to the power of three. So basically it means that everything in this thing scales 
perfectly for making it small. And then you can go and do whatever you take. You know, that is just electric engineering. You take one current and a bias field like this gives you a trap here. Two currents and a bias field like that gives you a trap here. I can make the bias field by using wires on the chip, then I get a trap here, and I can use the other bias field like this, and I get a trap in between. And uh, if I make a trap, if I bend my wire like that and have a homogeneous bias field, I get a portable trap. If I bend my wire like that, I get a, I get a, a trap which has a, 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 a minimum which is not zero. And so this is a trap. This is a wire configuration which allows you to cool atoms with the, with the mod. This is a trap configuration which allows you to trap atoms and make both action points. So it gives you a, a beautiful way of looking at these things. Now you're going to have to build them. So we, these are chips that we built. You put them in a vacuum. You, can, you connect them. You have some structures underneath which give you large traps. You have structures on top of it which give you small traps. And the other thing that was, was interesting is that how much of a current can I send through a small wire? Now a light bulb burns at about 10 to the 4 amps per square centimeter of current. 10 to the 4, 2 times 10 to the 4. If you take a thin gold wire on an entire mass and iron and silicon substrate, I can send up to 10 to the 8 amps per square centimeter through it without to break it. Why does that work? Because I have very good thermal conductivity. That's of course technology on semiconductor surfaces is very well known. And I, so they have a very good thermal conductance from the wire onto the chip, onto the chip substrate. And within the chip substrate, then it's boxes, very good box thermal conductance. And so I can really do very, very, put very high current, current density through that, which is, uh, uh, which is basically allows you to, to make these very robust and stable sets of traps. Because if you would calculate uh, uh, you know, which type of traps you can do for, for, you know, with the current entities that are the light bulb, it would be difficult to bring atoms in there. And uh, something that I, told, I always tell in that sense is that uh, sometimes it's important to just go in the lab and try it. I, when, I, when we first wanted to do that, you know, I didn't really look up how much of the current I can send through. I called up a friend and said, hey, do you have thin wires? And they had, they had very thin wires on a, on a, on a, on a substrate which they, which they used for plasma on the sides. And I said, hey, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a chip that you don't need anyone? Can I break your wires? So they went in the, went in the lab, in the, in the clean room at 6 in the evening and 7 in the evening, and tried to break these wires. They had, they, and the only thing is that we couldn't break them because we didn't have a power supply. These were such thin wires that we needed, even when we put 20 volts on there, and this was the largest power supply that was in the clean room because usually you probe things with millivolts there. Uh, and we, we had uh, six times 77 amps per square centimeters that we can set through and these wires were still alive. So I said, okay, this is the technology we do. And the first time I gave a talk about these chips, at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart of solid state physics, there were 15 people jumping in and said, This is impossible. They gave me 15 review papers. Why there is A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Why there is, you know, you cannot get more than 10 or 6 amps per square centimeter. I thought, Guys, you know, this is a measurement. And it turns out that, you know, they never measured for their things uh, gold on. Uh, on the semiconductor. They looked at all different other parts where, you know, where there's all different other dirt physics in there, but they never looked at the best technology that's there, and so it worked. So, yeah. So that, you know, probably if I, if I would have looked up the books and read all this, I would have never tried that. Yeah? Just go in the lab and just do it. I think sometimes it's, that's something important. Yeah, and you, you, you know, you can be multi-level structures, and these are very thin wires, these are a few hundred nanometer size wires and the larger wires on top of it. 
So you can play around and this is now it's, it's just technology that you can, can do this type of things. Of course you have to bring your atoms there. You have to mod modify the type of, of magneto-optic trap and everything else. Where you can basically take your magneto-optic trap and, and put it close to, to a mirror surface. So you make your, your if you want to bring your atoms there, you have to get the atoms close to the surface, which is where the wires are fabricated. So the best thing is you make this surface as a mirror. Now again, if you take gold on, on, a, on a semiconductor substrate, it's a perfect mirror. That's a mirror that is, has much less scattering properties than a good optical quality window. So if you take a chip like this, put a black surface behind there, and shine a watt of laser light on there, the reflection on the gold surface of the black surface is black. You don't see the light that gets reflected. If you shine a few milliwatts of a laser pointer through a good window, it blinds you yeah? from this scattered light. So it's, it's, these surfaces are extremely smooth, so you can basically, these are very good mirrors, and then you just have to put your, think about how you add your, how you put your quadruple field close to there so you can see that, and it turns out that's exactly the configuration that these U-shaped wires are to you. So and you, can, you can make large tracks, and it's very simple to see that if you have a very large track, and you have, say, two big wires and a small wire in the center, if you just switch off the current on the large wires and switch on the current on the small wire, you completely transform the large track, which is millimeters away, to something that is a few microns away from the surface. And you get all the atoms in there. So if you have them once in there, everything, if you did the calculation correct, it's going to work. Yeah? And, it's, and it doesn't, and it's not so, so difficult because you can also see that, you know, even if it's a wire on one side, it will work. So there's, yeah, you can play around with it and, and, and it's worth so you can take your, your, your structures that you make your atoms, basically you can get to in the end you have some kind of a structure underneath which gives you big traps and structure and you chip on top of it and so in the end things look, things look like that. You can even take your chips and you glue them on a, on a vacuum window that's, that's experiments for Max Planck. Where they, where they basically use the chip as, a, as, a, as part of their, their vacuum cell and they make very small cells of that. You're going to have to image the atoms close to the surface. For that, it's good if it's again if it's a mirror, then you get two images. One which is an image by reflection, the other one is a direct image where the light gets reflected before. So you always see two images. And these two images let you immediately calculate what's the distance. Of course, you have to be careful, very careful that there are standing waves. They are sitting there, so sometimes you see the atoms, sometimes you don't see the atoms. <coughs> so this is a calculation of this pattern should look like. It's a measurement of this pattern should look like. So you understand what it is, and you just have to be very careful of, of where you observe the atoms, and you can measure the distances, and so, yeah, you get a very simple. It's very easy to make just the bose energy balancing on, on one of those chips. And you can also use these chips as making sand waves, or making lattices, and you look at there's something we looked at, we saw when you look at, at, uh, at a block oscillations of atoms sitting on there. So there's what is that? So now we have atoms there. Now the question that you can ask is uh, wait a minute, these atoms are very, very close to the surface. Remember that's a room temperature surface. And these atoms are not terribly cold. That's an enormous temperature gradient. Yeah? Because you have to measure the temperature gradient in the temperature of the cold, in the units of the temperature of the cold system. It's an enormous temperature gradient. So uh, the question arose is, hey, so wait a minute. So what's going on there? Can these atoms be there? Can they be there cold? And something like that. So uh, there's a Beautiful calculations were done by Carsten Henkel, Potsdam. And it turns out that the real, the real interaction the surface can have with the atoms is because there are Johnson noise currents in the, in the metal. 
If the Johnson noise current is metal, it gives you fluctuating magnetic fields, and these fluctuating magnetic fields can couple up to the ions. It turns out that this is not so bad, but you know, it still lets you hold the atoms there for seconds. And uh, this was even measured, you know. And uh, you see that you know, even you know this is measured, this is on a on a this is very steep, different types of surfaces, but even on that surface, which was a, I think was a bulk metal, if you are a few microns away, you still have one second lifetime, and that's and the, the, the curves are in good agreement with these calculations from the Johnson noise curves. Yeah, that's again, if you get very close to the surface, you run into problems with Fanavas interactions. So if you get to get something like a micron away from the surface, you see that the atoms get a very large loss rate, and the very large loss rate comes because of your final interactions. So they hold the atoms there. But nevertheless, you can put everything together and calculate you know, how good, how much of the current can get through and everything like that. And it turns out there's one material property, which is how much, how much temperature rise can I have in the material. And you find out that you have basically, you can get, uh, get uh, if, you, if you calculate very cleverly your, your trip wires, you get tens of seconds of lifetime with very tight confinement. So it's not a problem in, 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 our, in our setup to do that. There's another thing which is, which is something which is important is that when people start to do that, some groups saw traps that look like that. So the density was not really uniform and you can go and look at these measurements with the density, how uniform this is, and you find out that, that there's a huge magnetic field of roughness in that thing, and it was predicted that the scaling is really bad in the distance. Uh, for where does this come from? It comes from the current doesn't flow straight. Imagine the current flows straight and the bias field and you have a nice track. But if the current, because of inhomogeneities in the material or surface roughness or whatsoever, it doesn't fly, flow straight. Uh, you see that. Now you can make a very simple calculation. Uh, if you have a bose energy condensate, then you are sensitive of current direction fluctuations in a range of 10 to minus 5 radians, which is extremely small. And uh, so you can use that to measure current flow. Basically is that you take the bose energy condensate, put it over a sample where you want where current flow, and you want to measure the current flow direction and basically measure the magnetic field change by looking at the density of the bose energy condensate. So how does it work? If you have a magnetic potential that, is, that looks like that, you take a th very cold thermal atoms in there, and you measure the density, you see that the density depends on you know, how deep this is. It's like an atmosphere. If you take a bose energy condensate, it's like a lake. Yeah? And it turns out that these are extremely good magnetometers. This is, for example, a measurement yeah, of a a bose energy condensate is very, very close to the surface. You see the density, and it's a, that's a single picture. This is, if you do many of those experiments, you see that you always measure exactly the same part. And you get a single shot sensitivity of magnetic field changes of 1.3 nanotesla per square root of hertz, which is extremely small because the volume that we have is a very, very high, very, very small volume. And so <coughs> this is the sensor. If you compare them to regular magnetic field sensors, you know, these are whole probes, this is a log scale, whole probes or, or, or other things. So it's basically a sensor which is as good as a squid, but has a much better resolution. So for a much better spatial resolution, and in principle, now there are people who think that can go down to here something like that. And the only sensor which is really in, in competition with that is, is the NV magnetic sensor. Yeah? So you can have an extremely small, uh, extremely good way of doing that. And so you can 
measure this type of. We could show that that you know it's not it has nothing to do with. We can show really pro material properties of the system, and the really funny thing maybe at the end on that is the following: if you, if you measure these current flow patterns, these are the, the magnetic field patterns. And you know what's strange? You see this? It looks like 45 degree angles in these patterns. Now, if you look at solid state books, there's this beautiful graph, say, I think they go back to Bütiger, where they say if you have a single defect center, if you get scattered of a single defect center, a magnetic field pattern around it should look like that. So when we first saw this, I thought, you know, wait a minute. These things are usually done at ultra low temperatures and it's a single defect in a very small spectrum. How, how can we see patterns like that at the room temperature gold film? Until we did a detailed analysis of, first of all, these patterns are there. You know, they are really statistically significant here. Yeah? Until we did a very good analysis of that and find out that, yes, if there way of how these, if this is not, if these defects are not arranged in white noise in the system, but they arranged, have a spectrum, you're left over with these type of things. And why, and how big these things are, and why these are these still an open problem? We were able to measure them. Nobody else was able to measure them before in that sense. And uh, some of the things were completely counterintuitive, so samples that were in all other solid state physics properties were supposed to be much, much more uniform, had the much larger problems of, of, of magnetic of inhomogeneities in these, in these defects, and samples which you would think of from, from other solid state measurements, which would be very inhomogeneous and very homogeneous ones. So it's a different probe looking inside that, and I think we can who will be able to... There are, there's now a whole series of experiments which are now done by uh, in Stanford by Ben Lev where he really looks into... he wants to look into how is, how is the onset of insulated transitions and things like that by this type of current flows. I think that's think probably... yeah, we can also use it. Yeah. Good, let's, let's end. Let's end here, and this one anyway will be used for, for uh, I've shown before uh, already, and we'll use later on in our experiments. Okay. Thank you very much. Beautiful.